Hello to everyone and welcome to Tenancy Deposit Scheme's latest webinar presented by John King, Head of Member Services at TDS. Today we'll be reviewing what you need to know about the End of Tenant Fees Act transition period. My name is Ben Michaelis and I support with webinar operations and delivery at TDS and I'll be your host today. A big thank you to everyone for sparing the time to attend this webinar today. We really hope that it is useful to you. Before I hand over to John, I'd just like to take the opportunity to let you know a couple of features available in our webinar platform today. Please feel free to ask any relevant questions that you may have. We'd love to hear from you. Please use the questions icon on your webinar dashboard to submit any questions that you may have. John and I will review all the questions at the end of the presentation and do our best to answer as many as possible in our Q&A session. Secondly, should you wish to take notes of today's session, you can do using the icon with a piece of paper and a pencil on top. This function also allows you to email yourself the notes afterwards, which is handy. Um, and just one final point from me, um, in the unfortunate event that you do encounter any internet or connectivity issues, please do try to refresh your web page in the first instance. Hopefully this resolves the issue for you. If for any reason this doesn't work, please close the webinar in your internet browser and try to click back on your webinar reminder email to completely refresh your connection. And hopefully this solves any issues that you may have. That's everything from me. I'd now like to hand over to John King for the presentation. John, over to you. Thank you very much, Ben, and good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, attending on another sunny day in the UK. We're very fortunate with the weather. Uh, but of course, I hope you're all keeping very safe and well during these most challenging times. And the private rental sector has always given us some challenges. And part of my role has been to talk to our customers uh, over the last few weeks, particularly about changes in uh, policy legislation and actions to give guidance to make sure you get things right. That's the key thing. Uh, the private rental sector may have had a, a bit of a slowing down, but the legislation and the requirements are still in full force. You need to make sure you're aware of them. So this episode of our webinar today, we're going to talk about the uh, Tenant Fees Act one more time and particularly the transition period. And I know the transition period ended on the 31st of May, 2020, but the impacts of that need to be addressed and brought to your attention, just so you can have a good understanding of what's necessary, whether you're doing things right, whether you're doing things wrong, are there things that you don't need to do, and what are the things you particularly need to be aware of? So we're gonna cover some of these areas this morning. Uh, over the next uh, 20, 25 minutes um, before we get some questions. And I'm sure everybody has questions, particularly uh, resolving, revolving around uh, new transactions that are maybe being carried out in the market today since the uh, government restricted, uh, lifted some of the restrictions on uh, lettings uh, in the marketplace. So we're gonna talk about uh, what is the Tenant Fees Act? When did it come into force? Um, what regions does the Tenant Fees Act cover and are there any different regulations for Wales? Um, what are prohibited and permitted payments, deposit cap levels and when is the transition period end date? Well, I've already, spoiler alert, given that one away, it ended on the 31st of May. Just to confirm, if you've got any questions as Ben was talking about, please submit those as we go through the webinar this morning and then we can work our way through as many as possible towards the end of the session. We'll give you plenty of time to bring those to our attention and we can give a little bit of a Q&A session towards, towards the end. So Tenant Fees Act. 2019. In Wales, it's known slightly differently. It's known as the Renting Homes in brackets, fees, etc. close brackets, Wales Act 2019. The key things you need to focus on are England, the legislation for the Tenant Fees Act came in on the 1st of June 2019. And that transition period ended, as I said, 31st of May. 2020. In Wales, the uh, legislation that affects uh, registrations and legislation for fees came in on the 1st of September 2019. So the key thing to remember, though, is the transition period 
only affects tenancies in England. There is no transition period uh, covering properties in Wales. So that regional differential is the first thing you need to pick up from this morning. Um, and there are a couple of others as we carry on. So just a little bit of a, a, an overview for you. The transition period that we're talking about here impacts on the ability to charge tenant fees after the end of the transition period. And what you need to look at is a short short hold tenancies uh, as they stand covering England. Uh, and those impacts relate to the fact that if you entered into a tenancy prior to the 1st of, eight, uh, 1st of June 2019, that means it didn't necessarily uh, affect the start date, but you entered into the contract, then all the regulations, all the clauses, everything you set out within that tenancy agreement, including any fees that were to be paid by the tenant, were okay and could be applied up until the end of the transition period. So if you had a fixed term, which was entered to prior to the 1st of June 2019, and that tenancy either ended its fixed term and became uh, some sort of periodic tenancy, either statutory or contractual, um, now we've gone beyond the transition period. Any fees that are in that tenancy agreement that are not permitted they are prohibited payments. You will not be able to apply those. Now we have gone post transition period, post 31st of May 2020. And that's quite relevant when we come to talk about adjudications and how an adjudicator at TDS who's dealing with a tenancy deposit a return, a dispute about any deductions to be made, whether you may be claiming for things that you, you want to claim for because it's in the tenancy, but you will not be able to apply post-transition period. So second thing to learn this morning is transition period affects England, assured short hold tenancies. And even though a tenancy may be ongoing in its original form, because it's now gone from being maybe a fixed term into a periodic tenancy, uh, even though you, you've got clauses in there which relate to uh, per, perhaps prohibited fees, you won't be able to apply those. John, my sincere apologies for just interjecting. I believe I've had some feedback that your camera is not showing correctly. Would you be able to just refresh your camera from your side? Is that Let okay? me do that for you. There we are. Oh, we can see you. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Pleasure. You can see me in my, my Dell. <laughs> Thanks. So, and that's probably changed your focus of concentration this morning as you now uh, turn your head to the presentation, please. Thank you very much for that, Ben. So here's a little uh, matrix document that uh, is available on the TDS website, and we'll give you a link to this later on. It'll be in the handout as well. Um, because remember in the Tenant Fees Act, there was also uh, an element which related to deposits, uh, what is commonly known as the deposit cap. So, We've put together a list of what you can do during uh, the when the fee ban came into effect, the Tenant Fees Act, the transition period, and now after. And of course, now you need to concentrate on after we've gone beyond the transition period. So if you have a fixed term tenancy, which subsequently became some sort of statutory periodic or contractual periodic, then you will not need to address the deposit uh, cap element. Uh, even if you've now gone beyond the transition period. It's only when you enter into a renewed tenancy, and that means you've written a new fixed term tenancy. So you've taken the original tenancy, which was maybe fixed term or went periodic, and then you've agreed with the parties, between the parties, the landlord and the tenant, to have a new fixed term. Then at that particular point, you must address any deposit reduction if required. Uh, remember, five weeks for deposits on annual rentals of 50,000 or less, 50,000 pounds or less, six week cap on uh, 50,000 annual rental, 50,000 pounds annual rental per annum in excess. Um, but again, of course, uh, fees, default fees will not be allowed. Now we've gone beyond the transition period. So even though your uh, 
may be making decisions about the deposit, the, the third thing you need to learn this morning is you don't need to do anything if your tenancy was an original tenancy entered into before the 1st of June 2019, that when the end of the fixed term came about, the uh, parties agreed to allow the tenancy to remain on a statutory periodic tenancy. The deposit will not need to be dealt with. Uh, and that's the same for a contractual tenancy deposit, a contractual periodic deposit. But in both those cases where the tenancy has now gone beyond the transition period, you will not be able to rely on fees. That is that is the key thing now we've gone beyond the transition period. So you may not have to deal with the deposit element. You may choose to, but there is no requirement to do so. Uh, unless you enter into a renewed tenancy, a new fixed term tenancy. But as far as fees, you will not be able to apply fees, even if they are in the tenancy agreement, even if the parties have agreed uh, to a deduction for a particular fee, you will now not be able to uh, apply that uh, on a default basis. Uh, you will have to look at whether it's a permitted fee. So that brings us on to this area under the Tenant Fees Act 2019 in England, uh, where there are prohibited payments, fees, fees that uh, cannot be charged and permitted payments. And essentially, there are very few permitted payments allowed. So the transition period means that uh, prohibited payments will not be able to apply it. Uh, and you need to sort of take the, the maximum that most fees are prohibited, including check-in and check-out fees. You won't be able to apply those even if there are in the, the tenancies, but there are some permitted payments and they are limited in England. And what I would emphasize is you may well have taken a fee that represented possibly a check-out fee for the end of the tenancy and you've now gone beyond the transition period. If you took a fee for a checkout, but you took that as part of the payment run at the beginning of the tenancy, now that you've gone past the transition period, that fee cannot be applied. And therefore that is money that needs to be returned to the tenant as it's a prohibited payment and cannot be charged. Just to reconfirm that again, there may be fees that you've taken, even though the tenancy started or it was entered into prior to the 1st of June 2019. But we're in a position whereby the tenancy has not ended yet, but you took the fee at the beginning of the tenancy. Now we've gone past the transition period. Advanced fees that aren't chargeable are not permitted. You'll need to look at returning those to the tenant. So early termination fees, these are some of the fees that may be uh, permitted um, and they have been written into the Tenant Fees Act legislation 2019 in England. So early termination costs limited to landlords financial loss. And there was a word in there reasonable. Um, so it needs to be kept to a, a reasonable level. Amendments to tenancy agreements possibly change of occupant, um, maybe even uh, allowing a pet to be in a property. And there's a charge that's being made to amend that tenancy agreement by way of uh, an addendum possibly, uh, but they are capped. Those fees are capped, maximum of 50 pounds, including the VAT. Uh, another permitted payment, loss of keys or similar security devices. That may be a remote control for a gate, uh, it may be a FOB for an entrance into a building. Those charges are restricted to reasonable costs. Um, and that's always going to bring to the uh, table costs of high-end equipment, which may be very, very expensive. I suggest you keep very, very clear evidence <coughs> of where maybe the cost uh, came about. So you've got all the evidence you need and ensure that you are listing in the tenancy agreement any of those permitted costs and what they would be. In addition, in addition to making sure you have those on a menu of charges um, that you may want to make sure that tenants understand are going to be coming their way as a permitted cost. And they should be listed, I believe, in lots of different places before they've even come into your 
uh, offices when we get to that point, maybe on websites, certainly in tenancy agreements, making sure you've pointed them out uh, as a landlord or letting agent what those permitted costs may be. Now, Ben, I think we're going to run a little snap poll at this particular moment. We are, yes. Yeah, we can we can launch that to the audience. And so we'd like a little bit of uh, engagement with you this morning, uh, some feedback. And we're going to put up a, a question, quite simple, and it will allow you to uh, have um, a, a choice. And it will be very, very good if we could have some feedback for you. So the question this morning is, uh, have your tenants asked for a tenancy deposit refund because of the Tenant Fees Act 2019? And uh, be nice to uh, get an answer because I think there is confusion from certainly from tenant side. They will look at the Tenant Fees Act and the deposit cap element and consider that they should be asking landlords and letting agents to return monies. Uh, you need to understand clearly whether there is a requirement for you to do so based on whether the tenancy was entered into prior to the legislation on the 1st of June 2019 or whether you've renewed the tenancy at the point of renewal, uh, you may well need to address that. So just give one more moment. We've got a few more votes coming in. Uh, I don't think it's going to change the outcome too much. I, don't and think so. I think it's pretty conclusive. It is pretty <laughs> conclusive this morning. So uh, out of uh, out of 96 people who've responded this morning, thank you very much indeed to everybody who participated. It seems that tenants aren't asking for deposits to be um, amended and any uh, excess returned. Uh, certainly, we see in our custodial scheme quite a rush to to do that, which was quite simple. It's a couple of clicks to be able to do that if you use our custodial scheme um, and the excess monies can be returned once the parties have agreed. Of course, if you're holding the deposit, you can manage that with your uh, with your tenants. Uh, and I'll just show you those results this morning. Fairly conclusive. Everybody's saying hasn't really been a problem. Haven't had those questions. Thank you very much for participating. It was a bit of variety this morning for you. So some key points for you to remember, um, list any permitted charges that you want to rely on in your tenancy agreement. And please be aware of what is available to you as far as a permitted charge under the Tenant Fees Act. Don't feel, fall foul of uh, any prohibited payments. Promote and make permitted charges available to potential tenants across all media you use. Ensure that there can't be the accusation, I wasn't aware, because the uh, Tenant Fees Act may well point that out, that, that you hadn't made it quite clear. And of course, you may want to return uh, any of those fees that were permitted um, prior to the 1st of June 2019, but taken in advance because they're now caught in the Tenant Fees Act uh, 2019 legislation. But now uh, this return of the money may be triggered by uh, either a tenancy renewal pre 31st of May 2020 or now the transition period when you're not going to be able to enforce those. And neither are TDS in their adjudications. Remember what I said earlier, that means if a dispute is brought to us and the dispute is about um, lots of different items, and one of those is fees that have been applied to a tenant, uh, if we can see that those are fees that, that couldn't be applied to the tenant, even though they're in the tenancy under the legislation, then we will have to say that we're not in a position to be able to make that award to the landlord under those circumstances. So there's a, quite a bit of information on our website available to you. Uh, we've got a lounge, uh, an information lounge on TDS um, uh, website, tenancydepositscheme.com. And you'll see here there is a, a fee ban matrix, which will help you decide where you sit and there's some, some extra information on our guides and legislation, including a, a dedicated uh, toolbox arrangement under our deposit cap uh, web page. This will allow you to just work out whether or not you need to return money, how much you need, and how you can go about 
doing that. So, uh, Ben, have we had some more questions this morning? I can see some coming in. We have, yes, we've got some good questions and thank you to everybody that have submitted thus far. If anybody else does want to ask any specific questions while we have John on the presentation, that would be fantastic. I'll start with the first one, John, that we've had come in. Um, can I choose to return a portion of the tenancy deposits regardless? So, yes, uh, the, the fact that the Tenant Fees Act will describe under what circumstances any excess deposit must be returned if the parties agree that uh, they want to do that. But remember, a deposit has been taken for the obligations of the tenant uh, under the tenancy agreement. And I would suggest that that money really should not be approached until the end of the tenancy because you don't know what sort of um, situation you're going to be left with in terms of dilapidation, damages, cleaning, missing items, rent arrears. And I think if you haven't had to uh, deal with a reduction in the deposit because the, the tenancy hasn't been renewed um, and you haven't got to that, to that point where you must deal with uh, an excess deposit amount, you're going to want to make sure there is, is enough available, uh, certainly as much as is possible available, to you and the landlord as a letting agent you want to make sure that you've guided your landlord correctly but I think a landlord would want to be put in a position where they had the most money to be able to address any deficits that they come across once the end of the tenancy has happened so I suggest that probably leaving the deposit as is until it's necessary would be the best guidance but um, the choice will be between the parties. Thank you for clearing that. Up, oh, John, that's super. Um, Dinesh asks, as a landlord, I get charged water usage by my management company with a service charge. I apportion the water element and charge to this uh, on to the tenant on a six monthly interval. Uh, is this a permitted charge? So we're talking about a utility, um, and the Tenant Fees Act doesn't cover things like uh, gas, electricity. Um, utility usage council tax. Uh, th this is a, a utility, a usage, it's a consumable. Um, out of interest, what we do get in some of our adjudication work is we may well see it not very well described in the tenancy agreement. Um, and I suppose that's easier if the particular uh, utility company, the water board, uh, the local supplier is uh, having a meter or, or is engaged with the tenant so that the account is purely in their name so that the landlord doesn't have to get involved. I think if it's supplied as a, a communal facility and it's being charged back to the tenant, then uh, I would want to make sure that that's detailed quite accurately within the tenancy agreement. Uh, and to make sure that the tenant is aware that that is their responsibility and you're not charging them a fee, you're just collecting back a utility which is due uh, and that, that they would pay for. Ultimately, of course, if, if all the, the bills, the service, including the water, is down to the landlord, if the landlord is looking to apportion some of that, uh, he won't be able to rely necessarily on the bill. So he needs to make sure it's detailed very, very well within the tenancy agreement under what circumstances uh, and what may be charged. Thank you for that, John. Hopefully, Dinesh, that answers your question. Um, next question is, is a little bit relatable. Andrew asks, what is the position now for recharging a tenant for a tenant fault contractor call out, e.g. their boiler needs rechecking because the tank has run out of oil? Yes. Um, and I think we're going to see, <clears throat> excuse me, a few of these where um, it's due to the tenant's action. Um, and again, I would probably refer to, to my previous answer where the tenancy agreement's going to, to make it clear under what circumstances that there may be a, a, a cost involved. But remember, if this is a, a contractor's fee, First of all, you, you can't rely on the contractor to charge the tenant. Uh, I think it's it's uh, quite clearly maybe a maintenance issue where you have to uh, support the tenant when they have a situation where something doesn't operate. But where there's use of failure, it, it may well fall on the landlord 
um, because to charge a, a tenant a, ch a call out charge because you've identified that it was their um, action or inaction which caused the, the contractor to be called effectively is a fee. And remember, there are very few permitted fees. Everything is prohibited. So I think you have to look at very carefully at whether um, the, the the tenant should be uh, described in his tenancy agreement under what circumstances uh, contractors may be called and under what circumstances any damage because effectively that that call out may be a result of tenant damage which may may be applied to the deposit at the end of the tenancy but as far as a call out fee you can see just in that word fee uh, you're not going to be able to apply that to a tenant in those circumstances Thank you for clearing that up. That's uh, that's brilliant. Hopefully it answers uh, the question. Next question. Um, where a tenant has not paid full rent during the COVID-19 period for two to three months, can this be claimed back from the deposit? Yes, a, a little, little bit left field of transition period. Uh, I, I would guide uh, any landlord or letting agent who has um, maybe have been approached by their tenant or even approached the tenant and said, you know, we understand the circumstances. Uh, we're going to do a, a reduction in the rent, whether that is a temporary uh, or a permanent reduction in the rent, because they are two different things. Uh, I think a, a, a temporary uh, a deferment of rent that is still due and then still remains outstanding at the tenancy agreement may be applied to the deposit if the clauses within the tenancy agreement say any identified arrears, um, the deposit could be used for, for that. I think if it's a if it's a permanent reduction, of course, uh, in the rent, um, that, that may well have a a different impact uh on the on the agreement whether uh, those are rent arrears or whether they are a, a loss that the landlord has agreed to accept to, to maintain the tenancy. So it's whether it is a, a, a deferment, a temporary, and therefore the re, re arrears are still due and are still being calculated and therefore could be applied to the deposit if the deposit clauses allow so, um, or whether it is a permanent reduction, uh, effectively the tenant doesn't have to pay that rent and therefore there's no arrears. Thank you for that. I know that was slightly off topic, but equally uh, important question. Um, let's let's uh, another one's just come in. What changes do I need to make to TDS records under either insured or custodial registration? Uh, <clears throat> I'll interpret that interpret that question to relate to the deposit amount. Yeah, I would, I would say it relates yeah. to that. I, and, I, and 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 I would say. Um, I, earlier I mentioned that if you register deposits using our custodial scheme, if you have uh, a requirement to reduce the deposit amount because you've renewed the tenancy and uh, maybe the deposit is now only five weeks uh, or six weeks, depending on the annual uh, equivalent rental, then uh, what you need to do is in our custodial scheme, we're holding the tenancy deposit, but we have put a, a, a a, a journey in there that you go in and when you log into the tenancy deposit you can agree uh, what the reduction is and calculate what amount you want to give back to the tenants then the tenants can log in and as long as their bank details are there to accept it payments will be made that it's a very short journey and it only involves a, a, a couple of clicks um, so therefore from the point of view of custodial it, it, it's it's very simple to manage um, on the insured side, if the letting agent or the landlord are holding the tenancy deposit, of course, they're able to manage the return of the deposit because they've got it. Uh, I would say, again, if you're renewing the tenancy and therefore you now are, are, are caught with the Tenant Fees Act and the uh, deposit cap element, then I would make sure that you are, uh, first of all, calculating what needs to be returned, agreeing it with everybody, including your landlord, uh, making sure that uh, there is a record in the tenancy agreement, maybe an addendum, 
some sort of receipt with the tenant. Um, and then twofold, uh, but the easiest way is to make sure you've got a copy of the original certificate when you registered the original amount. And then you can go in and edit the certificate to reflect the new amount. And then you've got a copy of the certificate when it showed, for instance, £500. And then you've got a copy of the certificate. Now it shows only £400. Just in case anybody said, no, 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 I paid £500. You've got an audit trail to show when the money was returned. You, re you reduce the amount that was protected and that all parties agreed that and, and maybe even a receipt to show when the money hit the, uh, the tenant's bank account. Thank you for that, John. Uh, another good question here, which is uh, quite a detailed one. So I think this will be, uh, be you're well, well positioned to help with this. So when, when renewing the tenancy, I'll need to return part of the deposit back to the tenants. Do I simply return the excess amount equivalent to a week's rent or do I return the full deposit six weeks worth and then request the new deposit five weeks back? Long question, short answer. If, if you're renewing the tenancy and you've already got the deposit amount, effectively you're just renewing the first tenancy. And therefore, if you're retaining five weeks, make sure the new tenancy shows the, the correct amount and you're just returning the excess amount to the tenants. Thank you for that. Um, short answers are often good answers. We love that. Um, next one. Uh, does a pet fee of £60 taken at the commencement of a tenancy have to now be returned? Well, it'll depend on the dates. So again, if this was a tenancy uh, entered into um, prior to the 1st of June, um 2019 and that tenancy had a fixed term and then continued on a statutory periodic tenancy and the parties that have agreed maybe a, a pet could be there and there is a charge for that pet um at the point of renewal uh, you're not going to be able to uh charge any further amounts for uh, a, a, a pet so you're going to enter into a whole new tenancy at that particular juncture um the question of, of a pet and, and charges for pets is, is quite an interesting one because this also relates to where people say, well, I'm going to take an extra amount on the deposit because I've allowed them to have a dog or, or, or a cat uh, in the premises. Of course, you, you won't be able to. There, there is a cap on the amount of the deposit. Uh, the, the question of whether you allow a pet comes into play. Uh, there are certain circumstances where landlords genuinely wouldn't be able to allow a pet maybe because the head lease if it's a leasehold property states that, that they can't so they're, they're not in a position to be able to get it um, or possibly uh, because the property maybe the landlord uh, intends to uh, live in the property afterwards and um, you know has some sort of allergy uh, um, situation diagnosis where you know they don't want to be in in a property afterwards but we are seeing questions where people are saying can i refuse to have a pet and a lot of clauses have a permission not to be unreasonably uh, withheld and i think that's what people need to focus in on so just coming back to that question of if, if part of the tenancy was that the there was a charge which cannot be made and it's not a permitted charge then uh, that permitted charge may have to be returned if the parties are entering into a new term under that original tenancy because that that fee is no longer allowed um, if the tenancy had ended before the transition period and new tenants have come in then it wouldn't have needed to be returned so the, the landlord there will have to look very carefully about that and, and and be very careful about trying to charge extra amounts for what is sometimes called a pet deposit there is you can't charge more than the deposit cap amounts on new tenancies, of course, be aware of that. Thank you for that. Um, next question, uh, a different type of question. Are inventories compulsory? No, um, <clears throat> there's, there's nothing in the tenancy deposit protection legislation which makes having uh, an inventory or a schedule of condition compulsory. Um, I'm old enough to remember when the legislation was first muted and uh, there, there was a drive to make it compulsory, um, but it has never been, been input. I, I know that uh, lots of inventory companies uh, who provide quality products would like there to be uh, a, a requirement to have uh, 
uh, a proper inventory or a schedule of condition. And the only guidance TDS would give is that, of course, if TDS are dealing with a dispute about the return of a tenancy deposit, then the better the evidence, the better it is for us to understand whether or not there is um, an obligation um, for the tenant to put the pack, put the landlord back in in a similar position. And the key documents in our world are the tenancy agreement, which sets out the clauses um, under what circumstances and what may be the liability. Uh, and then, of course, we need to see some sort of evidence which shows us that the parties agreed to a condition at the beginning and at the end of the tenancy. So the short answer is they're not compulsory. Uh, is it best practice? I, I would suggest yes, uh, because without that evidence, it's going to be very difficult for the parties to try and resolve the matter. And it's going to be even more difficult for an adjudicator to come to an outcome um, about any deductions that are sought from the deposit. Uh, on, on top of that, you know, the, the better the quality of the product, that means the better the inventory, the better the schedule of condition, maybe photographs, uh, you know, there is more chance of the parties coming to a resolution before it even comes to TDS because it, it's been set out and it's quite clear. But we, we often see evidence in, in different formats, uh, sometimes handwritten, sometimes just some photographs. But of course, the weaker the, the evidence, the, the more likely that the, the adjudicators kind of find it difficult to make an award. Thank you for that, John. And, and uh, I've had some some questions following on from your answer from this. And, and one of those has been around, um, we understand that we can't, you can't take an additional deposit for, uh, for the tenant. Um, but can we then insert a clause into the tenancy agreement requiring the tenant to be responsible for any damages caused by a pet or carpets needing to be professionally cleaned, for example? Um, so I would split that out. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, if the if the um, pet is allowed and it's in the premises, you know, the, the tenants are the parties listed under the schedule. They are jointly and severally responsible. And in the same way, they would be responsible for any guest who came into the, the property and, and dropped a cup of coffee or a glass of wine on the carpet. The, the, the argument couldn't be it wasn't me. It was it was somebody else is, is same for the dog and the cat. Um, and therefore, the obligation still sits with them. Um, and if it's identified as a change in condition from the beginning to the end, then, you know, I don't think there's any need to necessarily break that open. Um, I think the second part of the question was, uh, can we can we ask the tenant to have the carpets either uh, professionally cleaned or steam cleaned or, or fumigated? Um, I, I think this comes back to the what was the condition at the beginning? Uh, and I guess if the carpets were professionally cleaned and you could show uh, through receipts and a, an inventory that everything was in good condition, um, then the, the carpet should be returned in the same condition at the end of the tenancy. And if that means that the, the cleaning uh, was required to do that, then you would expect the, the tenant to bring it to that, that condition. If allowing um, a, a, a tenant to have a pet involved some sort of a, agreement rather than payment, which said, we're going to al allow you to have a pet, we didn't have the carpets cleaned uh, or fumigated at the beginning, but to allow you to have a pet in the property, we we require you to carry that out and, and show us that you've had that done um, with no fee and, and no agreement, uh, no um, uh, obligation uh, beyond a check to show that it has been done, then the parties are making that agreement. That's probably as far as anybody could go. Uh, but I think that the best way is, is if you're allowing a pet to be in the property is to make it very, very clear how the, the premises needs to be returned at the end of the tenancy and ensure that the, the parties have agreed to that. Uh, but the damage, I think you'll find, will be, will be covered by, by the tenancy obligations. And that would be anybody in the property, any guest in the property, any jointly and severally tenants all that damage identified couldn't be blamed necessarily on on fido or tiddles thank you for that john um 
Another good question. What happens if the tenancy deposit has expired in April 2020, but the council has just verbally asked for it to continue as a periodic? Should I still start a new tenancy deposit or will the old one still suffice? Um, Bit of a so if, if the tenancy expired on its fixed term in April 2020, I suppose I ought to give the caveat at this particular point that I'm, I'm not a legal advisor and I can't see the tenancy agree. But, but if it's expired and, and the parties have either by agreement or by document or by their actions allowed it to continue um, on a month by month basis or, or uh, a rent term basis, that, that has become a periodic tenancy. Um, if the deposit is uh, registered with TDS custodial, you know, it's protected and it's done. If it's protected with our insured scheme, um, you just need to, it, it's protected for the life of the tenancy. You would only need to re-register the deposit if you entered into a new new fixed term tenancy or, or a new agreement in total. So uh, from, from the description, from what's been asked in the question, I would suggest there is no need for anything to be done with the deposit if the tenancy is continued to be ongoing. But if you have protected it under our insured scheme, at the point you need to, uh, you, you renew that tenancy, you, you will need to re-register and pay again to protect the deposit under our landlord scheme under our letting agent scheme, if it's already registered, it's all already captured in your annual membership. Super, thank you for that, John. That was a, a tricky one. I have a, a bit more of a uh, one relating to agents here. My, uh, my, my letting agent will be charging me as a landlord an administrative fee to release my deposit back to tenants. Is this permitted? Well, I think the clue here is that legislation is the Tenant Fees Act. Um, if there is an agreement somewhere between a letting agent uh, and their customer, their landlord, uh, a service level agreement, um, conditions of business agreement, it's it, that you need to refer to because if it, if it states in there you're instructing us and under these circumstances charges will be due, um, I would suggest that, that that is what the parties have agreed to. Um, but but this covers tenant fees as opposed to um, chargeable fees to, to the landlord by their agent. Thank you for that, John. Uh, I think that clears that one up. Um, I think we'll come to, to our final question. Um, and I think this is uh, a, a good one to end on. Why is the transition period important for TDS on adjudications? Yes, I think uh, I think I alluded to it a couple of times, but there, there is an emphasis here that um, if we can see that the, the tenancy um, came to an end uh, after the transition period um, and um, the, one of the parties was where well, the landlord or the letting agent was seeking to collect fees from the deposit um, if we can see that they wouldn't be able to uh, apply prohibited fees now post 31st of May that's the important thing. So we, we would be saying in our adjudication, I can see that you've claimed for this fee, but the tenancy ended post 31st of, of May 2020 in England, a short, short hold tenancy, and um, therefore the fees are no longer applicable. And, and although it's written into the tenancy, but we can't apply them. Um, that's why it's important. I think if the if the tenancy came to an end prior to the transition period, um, then depending on um, the, the the tenancy, whether it was the uh, the old uh, fixed term that became statutory or a new renewed tenancy, of course, a new renewed tenancy even before the transition period, per during the period of the first of June to the thirty first of May twenty twenty, if you renewed that tenancy, you wouldn't be able to write. Uh, fee clauses into your tenancy, so therefore they wouldn't come to the surface. Um, but if the tenancy ended on the original fixed term during the 1st of June to the 31st of May 2020, then those fees may still be applicable. But post-transition, once the tenancy is ended, post-transition period, even though you may claim for them, even though they may be in the tenancy agreement, we won't be able to apply them uh, because then they're not permitted payments. Thank you so much for that, John. Really appreciate you taking the time to answer those questions. Uh, thank you to everybody for
uh, asking as many questions as you did do. I'm sorry for those that we didn't get round to. Um, and, uh, you know, they're always great to hear from the audience because then we can give some real life examples. Uh, and thank again for John for that. So that brings our presentation to an end today. So thank you to, to you for being able to join us. And uh, a big thank you to John for being able to tackle some of those testing questions. The uh, webinar recording will be made available and emailed to you in due course. So look out for that. There will also be a very short one question feedback poll at the end of the webinar. If you could spare a few seconds to complete this, we'd be really grateful. This will allow TDS to constantly improve our webinar content moving forward. There will also be a handout PDF available on your thank you email, which will be sent shortly after this webinar ends. The PDF file provides you with access to the TDS fees ban matrix. So hopefully that should be useful. Um, and the link to the PDF is normally located around halfway down the email. So just look out for that. All that's left for me to say is thank you once again. And we look forward to welcoming you on another TDS webinar very soon. Goodbye from us.